Okay, you guys ready? I usually start a sermon with a question. Here's the first question for 2024. Y'all ready? How many of you would say that your highest spiritual gift is being bitter and holding on to resentment? Like you're just great at it. Like unforgiveness, like every test you've taken, personality-wise or spiritual gifts, it just rises to the top as like your top, you know, one or two gifts, okay? Now, I'm joking, but... A lot of us are really dang good at it. I think it just comes naturally for most of us. It's not something we have to like work at typically to get good at. We are just good at holding grudges. We're good at getting offended. You guys are great at getting offended. My email is proof of that. It's just amazing, right? We get offended sometimes rather easily. But what happens is, is that offense turns to anger. And when we don't deal with that anger quickly, that anger turns to resentment, begins to fester inside, turns to bitterness, which then begins to actually poison every single area of our life. Have you ever met a bitter person before? Like a truly bitter person who's held on to some stuff for a long time. Have you noticed that it doesn't matter what they're talking about, that bitterness will come through? It's like a stench. It's an aroma. I don't know if you've ever hugged someone who uses too much cologne or too much perfume and then you smell like them the rest of the day. It's the same thing with bitterness. It kind of oozes out of our pores almost because it's festered inside of us for so long. I like how Joyce Meyer put it. She said, I know from personal experience how damaging it can be to live with bitterness and unforgiveness. Now, if you know any of her story, uh, traumatically sexually abused as she was growing up, really rough upbringing. When she says, I know from experience, she knows from experience. She says, I like to say it, it's like taking poison and hoping your enemy will die. That's what bitterness is. That's what resentment and unforgiveness do, not to the person, but to you. This is what Paul has to say about it. Ephesians 4, verse 31. Get rid of all bitterness. Now, this is interesting. He says all. He doesn't say just get rid of the the unjust bitterness in those moments where you think you're right, but you're actually wrong. And the person who you think wronged you actually didn't. He says, don't get rid of just unjust bitterness. He says, I want you to get rid of all bitterness. Even in those moments where you're right because they've wronged you, I want you to let go of that as well. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender hearted. This is tough. This is major leagues right here. I mean, how many of you have had someone that honestly, I mean, if you were to be honest, you'd say, I've actually hated this person either presently or in the past because of what they've done to me. And maybe you've gotten far enough where you're just like, man, I want to, I want to get over this. So you've gotten to a moment or a point where you can at least be cordial, or maybe you're just like, I'm just around them. I just keep my mouth shut whenever I see them. Whenever I think about them, I kind of want to throw up in my mouth, but I just like, I'm just kind of holding it in. What Paul says is, I actually want you to be tender-hearted towards that person. That's next level. That's coming to the point where you go, you know what? I've been damaged and hurt by this person, but this person also has been damaged and hurt by others. We like to say oftentimes that hurt people hurt people. And when we're tender-hearted, we go, this person is just as much a target for God's love and grace as I am. How many know that is very difficult when you've had someone hurt you deeply? And Paul says, I want you to get rid of all bitterness, but not just get rid of it. I want you to be tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. We looked at a verse last week that I feel like is a verse for our year. It comes from Micah 6.8 says, he has shown you, oh man, what is good. How many of y'all want what is good for this coming year? Right? God says, here it is. What does the Lord require of you but to do justly, which means to be honest, to be honorable. When you say you're going to do something, do it, right? He says, to, be, uh, to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. We talked about walking humbly last week. This week, we're going to talk about loving mercy. Now, mercy is simply undeserved forgiveness. And the light's dim because nobody wants mercy. Okay, there we go. Mercy is just undeserved forgiveness. Now, notice what God speaks through the lips of Micah. He doesn't say, just be merciful. He says, I want you to actually love mercy. This is hard. 
kind of. There's two parts to loving mercy. The first part, all of us are pretty good at. The second part's a little bit more difficult. The first part of loving mercy is where we actually love the mercy that's extended to us. I mean, how many of y'all are like, hey, I've sinned, I've messed up, but man, I love God's mercy. I love when he forgives me even though I don't deserve it. You know, you love that moment when you've done something wrong and you've gone and apologized and someone just forgives you. And you're just like, yes, I'm so good at loving that type of mercy. But what Micah is saying is, I don't want you to just love that portion of mercy. I want you to love the portion of mercy where you're extending it as well. That you actually get, if I can say it, excited to forgive someone who does not deserve to be forgiven. How many of y'all know this is a challenge, a big challenge, and not just for us. There's a, a story in the New Testament where the disciples struggled with this very thing. Jesus told them to forgive, and they're like, I, I don't know if this is possible. This is found in Luke 17, verse 1. And it says, Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come. What that means is you're going to find something to stumble over. You're going to find something to get offended at. Okay, this is going to happen. Happens to all of us. But woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with the millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves, Jesus says. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke him. How many of you are like, praise God, there it is right there in scripture. I'm going to do that. It says rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. Commandment of Jesus. Now it's interesting. The disciples, after hearing that, are going to go to Jesus and say, Lord, you got to increase our faith. Now typically we think of the disciples saying, increase our faith for something like raising the dead. Or when Jesus says, I want you to go do miracles and heal the sick and cast out demons. I want you to go do something impossible like calm a storm. And they're like, you got to increase our faith. No, when did they say it? When Jesus commanded them to forgive and not just to forgive once, but to, ref- to forgive a repeat offender. They looked at that and they're like, Jesus, this is impossible. If we're going to do that, you got to increase our faith because I look inside, they're saying, they're like, we look inside of ourselves and we can't find it. We can't find the strength to muster up that kind of emotional willpower. And I love how Jesus responded, verse six. Jesus replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. Jesus responds by saying, look guys, the faith that you're thinking you need in order to forgive someone who's hurt you, not just once, but twice, not just twice, but up to seven times and beyond. The kind of faith that you think you need to to let go of bitterness against someone who has traumatized you and hurt you deeply is actually a lot smaller than you think. He says it's the size of a mustard seed. Another way to put it is, it's almost as if Jesus is saying, look, if you just come to the point where you're wanting to begin this process. Like if you have just enough faith to want to forgive them and to begin this process, that's enough to cause this mulberry tree to be uprooted and cast into the sea. Some of us, we look at the bitterness, we look at the resentment, we look at the the trauma, we look at what happened, we go, this feels like a mountain, Jesus. How, How am I supposed to get through this? How am I supposed to climb this mountain and forgive? This seems impossible. I don't have the faith or the willpower to do it. And Jesus says, well, can you at least want to want to do it? Can you have that much faith? It doesn't take much, just enough to begin the process. This is what Jesus was inviting his disciples into. And I I just think it's hilarious because so often when we talk about mustard seed size faith, we think of like raising the dead, healing the sick, preaching the gospel in impossible situations. And Jesus says, yeah, but also for forgiveness. And if we're honest, I think most of us might relate to that more than anything else. Because when bitterness is there, man, it is hard to uproot sometimes. But Jesus says, just takes that much faith, that much faith. When you think about being a follower of Jesus, have you ever wondered, like, what's what's our brand? Like, what's going to make it clear to everyone around us that this is what Christ is all about? You know, you think of Coca-Cola. I've traveled to 
I think four continents, maybe five. Every single place I go, no matter how poor it is, Coke is there. Have you realized that? Like they may not have any food, but Coca-Cola is there. It's a brand that's recognizable worldwide. No matter where you go, you see Coke, everyone knows exactly what it is. What's our brand as Christians? What is it that's so recognizable about us? Jesus tells us in John 13, 35, he says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And loving one another encompasses loving mercy, extending undeserved forgiveness, letting go of bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness and saying, look, this is what Jesus did for me. This is what I'm going to do for you as well. Now, the big question is really how do we do it? Because some of you are like, okay, I don't want to poison myself or continue to poison myself with this anger and this bitterness and resentment. I'm, I'm kind of convinced, Ryan, like, hey, this is a process I think I want to, to begin and I think I can begin. Jesus is going to give me the faith to do it. But the real question is, how do you do it? I, I love Mario Murillo, uh, an evangelist. When he got saved, he told the story that someone handed him a Bible and his first response was, where's the trigger on this thing? How do I make it work? And that's how I like to look at scripture. How do we make it work? How do we put it into action? How are we not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word? And that's really the question for us, because it's one thing for me to get up here and say, stop being bitter. And you're like, okay, I believe you, but I don't know how to do it. Because every time I think about this person, I just want to walk the other way. Every time these memories come up, the emotions come up, and I don't know how to do it. I thought I have gone through that process of forgiving, but it still just keeps coming back up. How do we actually do it? There's lots of ways to look at the process of forgiveness. We're going to look at two things. The first one is really just kind of preparation for the second, which is what I want the main focus for us to be today. But the first one is this. You got to acknowledge the hurt. Some of you play that, that kind of false humility thing where you're just like, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine. It, it, it didn't really hurt as you're like bleeding to death with this emotional wound, you know? It's, like, oh, it's not a big deal. You can't forgive what you have not acknowledged. And God commands you to forgive. So in one sense, when we refuse to acknowledge the real offense, we're actually disobeying Jesus. There's a story in Genesis chapter 50, or it culminates in Genesis 50, of Joseph from the Old Testament. You know, his brother sold him into slavery. He was imprisoned for years. Finally, you know, he becomes second in command of all of Egypt. And then there's this moment when his brothers, who are like impoverished because of this famine, are before him begging for food. They don't know who Joseph is. He knows who they are. And he's just kind of toying with them a little bit. It's like a cat with their prey. You know, and it's such an amazing story because it shows the real wrestle, the real process in Joseph's life of, do I hang on to this bitterness that I've had for so long? Do I hang on to this resentment and anger? I can behead them if I want. I can throw them in the deepest, darkest dungeon and let them rot. I can do anything I want because I'm in power and they're not. And you see this process of him coming to a place where he acknowledges the wrong, but then he releases the bitterness and the resentment, and he forgives. We see the culmination in chapter 50, verse 20, where it says, you intended to harm me, Joseph says, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And then he reassures him. He says, so then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. Do you notice how he acknowledged the wrong though? True forgiveness came, not by brushing it under the rug, but by saying, what you did was wrong and it hurt but I'm choosing as a powerful decision to forgive you. Now, some of us have gone through this and, and, and we've tried to do that. We've acknowledged the hurt, we've tried to forgive, but these emotions, these feelings keep coming up. These memories keep coming up of what they did and what happened to us. And some of us have this false idea that releasing bitterness, or another way to say it is that walking in freedom means that I'm going to forget these memories, that they'll never come back that's not true freedom. True freedom is when you can see the person and not have the visceral response that you did. True freedom is when the memory can come back, but the sting of those negative emotions are no longer present because Jesus is present and he's actually healed those emotions. Several years ago, I mean, this must have been 18, 19 years ago, 
I was either preaching or leading worship. I can't remember which one. And this lady came up to me after the service. We're down at Elite Drive, just weeping and crying. But it was like tears of joy. And I'm like, hey, what's going on? She's like, I got to tell you this story. She said, three years ago, my uh, daughter-in-law had an affair, left my son, left their three kids, just abandoned the whole family. And it's just, I've been so angry for these last three years. I just, she said, I hate her. And she said, every time I hear the song, uh, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord, I just get this visceral response and the anger and the hurt and the rage come back up again because that was the song that was played at their wedding while they took communion. Well, whoever was leading worship that Sunday morning had led that song in worship. And she said, something happened. She said, I just met with the Lord as that song was playing. And it's like the Lord came in and he just helped me to forgive. She's like, I could just feel the anger and the rage and the bitterness just leave. And the Lord just began ministering to me. And I found myself literally raising my hands and singing. She said, before that, if it came on the radio, turn it off. She said, literally, I'd be in church services where they were singing that song and I'd walk out of the building because I couldn't handle it. That's what freedom looks like. That's what healing looks like. I can be in front of the person. Doesn't mean I got to have a great relationship with them, but I can be in front of the person and not still feel all those traumatic emotions. The memories can come, but the Lord has come in and brought healing to the negative emotions tied to those memories. Is this making sense? Okay, that's what freedom looks like. The problem is how do we get there? Because so many of us have tried I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. Why does it not feel like I've forgiven this person? Because I still hate them inside. I forgive you, I forgive you. What we're gonna look at today is kind of an interesting story, not one that you would typically look like, look at when, when you're trying to discover how to forgive someone deeply. But there's a key, I believe, hidden in this story that's gonna unlock forgiveness, that's gonna dislodge bitterness and resentment in many of our hearts. The story is found in Luke chapter seven. And we're going to begin in verse 36. It's a story of Jesus and this incredible encounter that he had with both a very religious, arrogant person and a woman who is absolutely broken. In verse 36, it says, One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee, this is where it gets interesting, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, either under his breath or more likely just in his own mind, if this man were a prophet he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Now, this is interesting. Word has gotten around about Jesus, okay? He's done miracles. He's had words of knowledge. He's raised people from the dead. Like, word is getting around. There's healings that are taking place. He's known as this prophet. He's preaching the word of God with authority unlike anybody else of his day. And so this religious leader invites him over for dinner not because he's interested in believing him, but he's just like, I want to find out what this guy's all about. He's there to test him, right? And so he goes and he says, okay, I've heard this guy is a prophet. And in his mind, when he sees this woman, an immoral woman of the city, such an interesting description, right? At Jesus' feet, he's going, there's no way this guy's a prophet. If this guy was a prophet, he would know what kind of sinner is touching him. And if he was really a prophet, then he wouldn't allow her to touch him in the first place. That's how the Pharisees rolled. Now look at Jesus' response. Actually, let's back up. Let's not look at his response yet. Here's the question. Okay, was the Pharisee right in his description of the woman? Yes. Was she a sinner? Yes. I mean, her business card was, you know, immoral woman of the city, great at sinning. It's who she, it's what she did, right? Right? How many of y'all know there's a difference between facts and truth? The Pharisee got the facts right. He got the truth wrong. You go, what do you mean? What do, you, what do I mean? Facts are just data points. Facts are she sinned and had a reputation of sinning. But then that Pharisee spun a, a narrative, a story that he called true based upon those facts. 
His story was, this woman is untouchable. There's no hope for her ever being restored. She just needs to be rejected. And Jesus, having the same facts, y'all think Jesus knew that she was a sinner? Yeah. He, he knew everything. But he looked at those same data points, those same facts, and he spun a different narrative. He told a different story about her life and the possibilities that she could encounter. We see this verse 40. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. I love that. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. Poor Simon, he has no idea what's coming. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other, but neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Isn't this great? Simon's thinking, oh, this guy's no prophet. And Jesus literally is reading his mail at that very moment, knows every thought going through his mind. Verse 43, Simon answered, well, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman. He's speaking to Simon, but he's looking at the woman. This immoral woman of the city, this this woman who's got a reputation. He looks down at her and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell, this is so interesting. Where did she get that perfume? How did she afford it? Sin. Sin right? Most think prostitution. It's an amazing story, you guys. The Lord's like, that's just been redeemed. Even though it came about from sin, it became something that was offered to Christ in worship, not the prostitution part, (laughs) but the perfume. It's just unbelievable in this story. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, okay, here's where it gets interesting. Jesus is now relaying the same facts that the Pharisee has relayed. I tell you, her sins, and they are many. Here comes the truth, though, a different story, a higher narrative. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven, so she has shown me much love. It's incredible. Now, here's the key. Here's the key in this next sentence that has the potential to unlock unforgiveness, bitterness, and resentment in our lives. Jesus says this, but a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Some of you are like, I've tried, I've given so much effort to forgive this person. Maybe it's your mom. Maybe it's your dad. Maybe it's a a teacher. Who knows what it is? Maybe it's a spouse a brother or a sister, somebody at work that you just can't say, like, I've just tried so hard to forgive them. What Jesus says is, those who have been forgiven much themselves, their natural automatic response is to begin pouring out love to the people around them. Those who've been forgiven little, love little. What I want to suggest to some of you is that you've been putting in effort, but you've been placing it in the wrong uh, place. You've been giving it to the wrong thing. Some of you have been trying to forgive, and that's your problem. What you need to do is do like this young woman, first and foremost, and you need to sit under the Lord's love. You need to sit under his forgiveness first. I'm all about return on investment. (laughs) I'm like, where, where can I get the max return for whatever effort I outlay? And what Jesus is saying is this. If you want the greatest return in the terms of, of uprooting bitterness in your life, don't put so much effort into forgiving people. First, start, start by putting all your effort in receiving the love and the forgiveness and the mercy and the grace of God in your life. Let's say, let's say one night, I don't know about you, but when I'm dealing with unforgiveness, it usually happens either late at night or first thing when I'm wake up. And let's, let's between, you know, imagine it's late at night and you're laying in bed and these memories start coming back of what that person said. 
of what that person did. Now, not just the memory, but those feelings are coming back. And you can feel your blood pressure increasing. You can feel uh, the anger swelling and the hurt. For some of you, it's a traumatic thing. You're starting to break out and sweat. You're just kind of like, oh, I can feel this thing coming on. What do we do in that moment? You need to sit up in your bed right then. And you start praying, Father, I thank you that you have changed my life forever. Father, I thank you that I am a new creation in Christ. The old things have passed away, the new things have come. Father, I thank you that your love for me is undeniable because Christ hung on the cross. And greater love has no man than this than a man lay down his life for his brother. You laid down your life for me. Your love is undeniable in my life, in this situation. God, I know that what this person did was wrong, but you have done me so right. Your blessing, your grace, your mercy covers me, Jesus. Father, I thank you that new life has come. What they did has nothing to do with who I am laying here in this bed. I thank you that they can't haunt me. They can't torment me. They can't direct my life. Only you can. And you begin praising Jesus and declaring, and it's almost like taking a shower under his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness. Now, what is that? That's spiritual warfare. Because how many of you all have experienced this? You'll have a person that, that just triggers you for lack of a better word. That's just, it's hard to be around this person. And it's almost like the devil knows it. So everywhere you go, that person is turning up. Anyone have that experience? And you're just like, what is going on? You're like, clearly this is Satan, okay? Memories get, keep, you know, sometimes you'll have a traumatic moment and you can be watching something on TV. You can be taking a walk on the beach, like something completely unrelated. And you'll see like a stone on the beach and all of a sudden it triggers a memory. You're like, that has nothing to do with anything, but that just triggered a memory, right? Now, when the enemy does that, because he's constantly wanting to bring that back in front of you. Why? Because he hates you. You're creating the image of God. He wants to destroy your life. He wants you bound up in bitterness because he knows it will poison you and he'll gain control of your life. When those things happen and he throws those memories and he throws those feelings in your face and he throws that person right in front of you, if you begin to do this, if you allow that moment to push you into praise, I guarantee you the enemy's gonna stop. <laughs> Because if you start declaring the gospel of Jesus over your own life, every time that temptation to feel that way comes, that temptation to hate comes, the enemy is going to go, uh-oh, this is not working. I'm pushing him towards Jesus and not away. I got, I got to find a different tactic. But not only that, as you begin to recount what God has done for you and receive his love and his forgiveness, try this. I guarantee it will happen. Your heart's automatic response is going to begin to be loving and releasing the person who's hurt you in the first place. That's what Jesus said. Those who've been forgiven much, love much. It's spiritual warfare, you guys, of the best kind. Paul says it like this in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4. He says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but of divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. This is what we're doing. So the question for you, the question for me is, who do you need to forgive? Where is it where there's like a pocket of bitterness or resentment? that's in your life. Guys, don't let it sit there. It'll fester. I mean, how many of you have left raw meat in the trash can overnight before and woken up and you're like, why is there rice on the ground? Why is that rice moving? That's what many of your spirits look like. Your souls are festering because you haven't let go of bitterness and resentment. You are poisoning yourself. And if you hold on to it, it will begin to ooze out of every part of your being. Who do you need to forgive? I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but I am saying it's going to be good. What do you need to let go of in order to grab hold fully of all that God has for you in 2024? I just cannot encourage you enough. Do it. Start by knowing how much you've been forgiven. Remind yourself and the devil every time he comes calling, no, Jesus has loved me. Jesus has forgiven me. This is who I am. 
I am a recipient of his mercy, his compassion, his grace. Because I'm a recipient of his mercy and compassion and grace, I will also extend his mercy, compassion, and grace to every single person around me. What they've done doesn't define me. Jesus defines me. My identity is in him and him alone. Even what I've done to myself doesn't define me. He defines me. He is the one and the only one who has the right to tell me who I am. You begin declaring over yourself, this is who I am. It's in Jesus. It's in Jesus. It's in Jesus. It's his love. And watch as that bitterness just begins to crumble inside of you. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for loving us so well. Oh my goodness, you're so good at it. And we're so undeserving, Lord, but we're really, really grateful for it. Father, we just as a family, like any of us right now who've been holding on to anger, resentment, bitterness, any of that stuff, we just repent. We're wrong and you're right. Even though we've been wronged and maybe are right in the fact that we have had an offense against us, we're still wrong holding on to it. And we just declare it and say, Lord, would you free us? Remind us of what you've done for us. Let your love just come like a shower and pour over us. We thank you that that Romans 5 says we're now standing in your grace every single moment, every single day. Would it permeate the very core of who we are, Jesus, so that what oozes out of us is love and grace? What oozes out of us is forgiveness. Would you bring us to a point of actually loving mercy, Jesus, receiving it and giving it. Father, I just want to declare freedom over us. That just the trauma of, of, of those, those negative emotions that are tied to things that have happened to us, Lord, tied with all the unforgiveness, that would stop, that this would be a year. We're not willing to move into another year the same way that we ended last year, Lord. Would you come in and bring freedom? And I pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen.